I'm here today with my friend Bob Borisaj. He's a contributing editor to The Nation magazine and the co-founder of the Campaign for America's Future, which I had the good fortune of serving on the board of for several years. He lives in Washington, D.C. He's been at the center of progressive politics for many, many years, and uh, we're approaching the inauguration of the Biden presidency amidst the turmoil and chaos that's taken place around the Capitol building, and I wanted to spend some time talking with Bob about uh, what's happened and what needs to happen to help America get back on track. Bob, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Good to hear your voice. Well, we're in this cauldron now. I think everybody, uh, how would I say, was was knowing that there was a lot of dissatisfaction on a lot of different sides. In many ways, people were quite clear that Donald Trump, I know John Shields wrote a book uh, called Trump's Democrats, which talked about what happened during the George W. Bush, Obama, and Clinton years that that fostered the turmoil, but it really hit a flashpoint on the storm of the Capitol. And I'm curious how you explain what happened, how you see what happened that day, and what signal does that send to our incoming president and his cabinet about where we need to go to well, it's obviously, uh, restore yeah. confidence? It's obviously a signal of how divided the country is and how impassioned and angry a, a good portion of it is. Uh, and then the question is, uh, how do you, what do you see as the cause of that? It's pretty easy to take the position, well, this is Donald Trump's uh, you know, contribution. He's been uh, spreading hate and division. Uh, and then he spread the lies about the campaign and roused his people to, uh, to come to the Capitol and, uh, and sent them off uh, to, to sack it. And so the, you know, the tendency is to focus on him and his impeachment and his punishment but I think the reality is the, the anger will continue even Trump ought to be punished. But even when Trump is punished, the anger is not going to go away and the rage doesn't go, go away because it comes from, uh, in significant degree, a, the, a middle class which has been savaged over the last uh, 50 years of the conservative era, since or 40 years, since 1980. Um, where we've had an, an entire working class that's really been displaced and uh, gone from jobs that at least for the white working class gave them a modicum of security, health care, retirement, decent pay. They could send their kids to college. And now for a huge number, uh, that's no longer true. Uh, health care is increasingly unaffordable. College is out of reach for their kids unless they go into massive debt um, and their jobs, uh, their wages are down uh, and uh, inequality is at uh, obscene and growing levels. When Trump ran four years ago, uh, uh, you know, against the elite consensus that had uh, created those conditions, and he was quite explicit in his campaign and in his, in his inaugural, indi- indicting the establishment, saying their victories were not your victories, They've prospered while you've uh, suffered, and this is going to change. Now, of course, the promise that it would change was a lie. He did basically traditional Republican policies to the extent he did anything and continued to do the race-bait politics that has been the foundation of the Republican Party. But um, he did, uh, you know, take on the trade stuff a little bit. He did take on the elites and keep uh, uh, kind of sticking a middle finger in their face. And uh, there was a whole range of people who believed he was their champion. Uh, And I think the question, you know, when Biden ran and Biden ran against the pandemic and the total mishandling of the pandemic by Trump and uh, on a return to normalcy, as he put it, um, I think the, the real challenge for Biden is there is no going back to normalcy. Uh, we've, he faces unbelievable cascading crises 
Um, the pandemic, of course, the collapse of the economy, the climate change, which is intense, the racial upheaval. Uh, and if you think you can go back to that elite consensus, you're utterly wrong. Uh, and so the question is, even with very slim majorities in the House and, and basically a divided Senate, can he find the way to uh, lay out large things that have to get done uh, and develop uh, both the congressional majorities and uh, the popular support that uh, allows at least some good portion of it to get done? Uh, and it's not going to be an easy task, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how does uh, the foreign policy play a role here? There was very clearly, as Dean Baker has shared with the audience on this podcast, a period where American multinational corporations, finance and what have you, allowed uh, which I might call a connection and opening and globalization, particularly with China, but throughout the emerging world. During that period, the disruption, the displacement uh, in the realm of manufacturing and the widening of income distribution was accompanied by tax cuts for the wealthy and the powerful. And then when Trump came in, he blamed it on the Mexicans and the Chinese, essentially, as opposed to the lack of response in what you would call adjustment assistance to the changing shape of the American economy. And I, I had meetings in China with some of the very top people in their government, and they said, we are large. The per capita income in China is 140th of what it was in the United States in the late 1980s. And the convergence was going to create profound transformation. But we were powerless to affect how the American government treated their people in response to that. Now, there are others now in a more modern time talking about intellectual property rights and so forth. And as Dean says, we're now hawkish on China, but it's not about labor conditions and environmental conditions, our hawkishness is more focused on, how would I say, the, the intellectual property rights of pharmaceuticals, entertainment companies, or what have you. So you have a U.S.-China kind of symbolism of discord that Trump amplified. You have lots of long-term pain. How, how does Biden look to Asia? Places like China, India. Well, now uh, and integrate that with what you know, is now, happening now and going forward. In light of the distress, yeah. can we make win-win climate agreements with China as a Biden administration, which I would say would be being a steward of the world and in the future of our children? Or will he be viewed as weak or capitulating to the Chinese and all those other insinuations among the enraged? Well, the question first is, what does Biden want to do? He's brought in for his foreign policy team uh, the people who have been uh, very skilled, very smart, very experienced, and involved in all of the ruinous policies of the last decade. So these are the corporate free traders. These are the interventionists uh, who believe America is the indispensable nation and has to basically police the world. These are the people who were for uh, going into Iraq on the Democratic side, who were go for going into Syria or Libya, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of them basically have said in various writings, well, mistakes were made. And we're reconsidering where we were. And we understand that uh, we have to have a different policy now. But America is still the indispensable nation. We must sit at the head of the table. And we are uh, threatened by China and uh, Russia. So we're gearing up to, do, to you know, build military forces in the Pacific and to 
to uh, confront uh, Russia on the, uh, you know, for its uh, temerity in, in the Ukraine, etc. And, um, you know, the, uh, and we can walk on two legs. We can both have the Cold War with China and do climate agreements with them. Well, I think, I, I think how that settles out is going to be critically important. Um, and it's, it really is about what America's policy is, not what China's policy is. One, are we the indispensable nation and we're going to continue endless wars around the world? Or are we going to, you know, shut them down and not pretend to police the world and have a much more, uh, much more of a policy of restraint? Two, do we gear up for this Cold War with two, both Russia and China at the same time? Or do we decide that we ought to find the common ground we ought to have on nuclear weapons and on climate particularly uh, and, and follow that. And instead of blaming China for our trade policies, will we in fact create our own industrial policy, our own uh, social welfare policy, uh, our own conditions around uh, research and investment to develop uh, you know, a more vibrant manufacturing sector, uh, which is all policies we could do and must do on our own that they have nothing to do with what China does or, or our relationship with China. Those questions about how Biden chooses uh, and how the people around him choose are really still open uh, and uh, unclear because if they go, if they're, they're uh, loyal to their record, uh, they are really out of step about where, where the country needs. And hopefully they have, have in fact have, a con have had a conversion, although there's every good reason to be skeptical of that. Well, in the, uh, obviously the pandemic has created the need to support society with a very significant amount of fiscal capacity. And on the horizon, as you mentioned in an earlier part of this presentation, is the challenge of climate change. Uh, yesterday, I happened to hear a very interesting conversation between Joseph Stiglitz, Peter Orzag, and uh, former Secretary of the Treasury, Robert Rubin, where Robert Rubin said, if you look for how to, how you say, create or mobilize the fiscal capacity that we need for all these things, including the ongoing pandemic and potentially climate, we should look at the performance of our healthcare system because it's not producing, according to WHO and others, a very high quality, but it is 30, it's many tens of percent more expensive. And obviously the government with Medicare, Medicaid and things pay for some of that. So there could be fiscal capacity created to devote to these social ends, but they involve very profound transformations in political economy. I guess I would throw in the military industrial complex and nuclear modernization when supposedly the Cold War is over as another chapter in the, what I'll call rent seeking pressures to use fiscal capacity for things that are not as uh, what you might call nourishing to the body politic and helpful, therefore, in calming things down and putting us back on track. How, do, how would you, how do you see Ruben's suggestion or how the Pentagon is to be dealt with? Uh, and uh, it, it, it what, what scope is there for rising to these challenges in what we might call the Green New Deal? Well, Biden, of course, is uh, committed to a expansive investment agenda around alternative energy and uh, reconstructing America in a much more green and efficient infrastructure. Um, and so that's the commitment. He won't use the term Green New Deal because he's worried about Republicans having uh, besmirched it. But uh, basically... Uh, been committed and, and recommitted himself last night when he laid out his program saying he's going to come back with a, a green investment infrastructure as the second 
uh, stage. But the question you raise about healthcare and about uh, the military industrial complex is really about the uh, the kind of uh, entrenched corruption and the entrenched interests that uh, dominate and distort our policy. So our healthcare system is about twice as expensive as that of the European countries and serves less people and does has worse health results. And it's because big pharma and the hospital complexes and the private insurance companies uh, take out a huge amount of money in profit and in administrative fees uh, and keep us from having an efficiently run system, whether it's Medicare for all or a, a, a national health care system or a all payer system with different forms. Uh, we, we have one of the most inefficient uh, systems and costly systems because of those interests. And let me just give you an example of that, which I'm sure you know of. When uh, George Bush passed the uh, prescription drug uh, benefit in Medicare, the Congress uh, put into that bill a prohibition on Medicare for negotiating bulk discounts on drugs, which every other country in the world does. And so we, in, we spend a lot of money inventing these drugs, public money. Uh, we give them to these private uh, big pharma companies. And we pay the highest price in the world for, for the same drugs that we help develop because the other countries demand uh, bulk discounts and, and we are prohibited by it. Now, the guy who was the chair of the committee, Billy Towson, that put that in, retired the next year and became took the job as a million dollars a year as the chief lobbyist for who? For Big Pharma, for the, for the drug companies. So the corruption is pretty blatant, and it's not just partisan. So uh, Democrats campaign for two cycles. This is an outrage, which it surely is. We're going to change this. We're going to uh, reverse it. And when Obama came in to do uh, his health care reforms, the first deal Rahm Emanuel, his chief of staff, cut was with Big Pharma to keep the prohibition on Medicare negotiating bulk discounts so that Big Pharma would not lobby against the health care company. So, you know, it's not uh, an accident that these things don't work. It's the same thing with the military industrial complex. We're now spending more on the military than we did in real dollars, inflation adjusted dollars, than we did at the height of the Cold War under Ronald Reagan. Uh, and that is nuts, right? The Soviet Union is no more. The Warsaw Pact has collapsed. China is, yes, of course, growing and getting more powerful but it has no global uh, aspirations. Uh, it's trying to, inf to build its own uh, area of power in the South China Sea. Um, and otherwise, we're just chasing terrorists around the world and keeping unending wars in places like Afghanistan that have no purpose, as far as anybody can tell, except we're not prepared to get out and, and, and lose the war. And so we're wasting untold amounts of money. But again, you have this very powerful uh, uh, corporate uh, complex, plus the Pentagon, uh, as a lobby on uh, sustaining that, uh, that uh, those resources. And you've got an ideology about it as America as an indispensable nation. And of course, both parties are part of it. Uh, and so the Pentagon budget keeps going up, even though it is now obscenely uh, bloated, uh, incredibly uh, inefficient and corrupt and uh, and draining both resources and attention uh, on things we don't need and will never use, I hope. Well, the uh, I think you make a good point, which is those incentives to follow on to the rent seeking, the lobbying, the campaign contributions and what have you is something that all of the representatives are subjected to. I once talked to, I used to work as you know, in the United States Senate, and I once talked to a Senator who I won't name. And he said, the biggest problem with this job is that I spend 75% of my time raising money to do policies that I don't believe in, in order to survive. And both Democrats and Republican candidates are subjected to what you might call that force field of incentives. 
how do we get to a place, Bob, where uh, you can get a legislature to enact a law which makes all of the incumbents more vulnerable to challenge because the incumbents can sell policy to raise their war chest, whereas challengers only have what you might call that out of the money option of getting in office and then making good on the promise ex post. How, how do we get this system to be more responsive? Well, I think there's only two ways that are both uh, external to the Congress. That is, you have to have a rising, uh, militant, uh, angry populist movement that is demanding change, particularly in the way, among other things, in the way we fund our elections. And then you have to have the elite that is funding these things, that the one half of 1% that I think provides like 60% of all campaign finances, you have to have them sobered enough about the instability in the society that they decide it's time to make big changes and they use their money uh, to get their legislators to do things that they might otherwise not do, both on substantive policy and on uh, strengthening and reviving the democracy. Uh, we're not there yet, but uh, we're getting close where the pressures uh, and the fear of instability in the system ought to be uh, uh, making the wiser people among the, the elite uh, alarmists. And certainly you've seen the, the uh, increasing movements and uh, disruption on both left and right, uh, both progressive movements and reactionary ones that are expressions of uh, the anger that this uh, rig system is creating. So, uh, you know, maybe there's a possibility. You know, one of them, just as a footnote, one of the most ex exciting things about the Bernie Sanders campaign was that in two cycles, he demonstrated that a, a progressive candidate with a clear, uh, forceful populist agenda could raise in small donations enough money to be financially competitive against the big donor funded candidates. Uh, in this last round, he raised more money uh, than the other candidates uh, with small donations. Uh, if you could get Congress to pass uh, matching funds for small don donations rather than large donations, you could have congressional candidates and Senate candidates and, uh, and presidential candidates all able to compete in a relatively ego even way with the big money, uh, given that possibility. And it would be very, uh, needless to say, very important in terms of opening up the possibility of reform for that to happen. Let me come back to the uh, the financial sector, and we we live in a world now where, how would you say, uh, very very low interest rates. As you have an aging population, their retirement benefits are are being compressed, and unless what they call the real economy, meaning the non-financial economy starts to invigorate, it's not going to push those rates back up. Do you see things related to how the financial sector or the governance of the financial sector is operating that are candidates for a reform that would contribute to the reinvigoration of confidence in our society? Well, here I'd be wise simply to uh, turn that question back to you, who knows a lot more about the financial sector than I do. But let me just make one comment uh, here, which is the low interest rates now, with even with uh, before the pandemic, with unemployment uh, very low, um, the low interest rates are an opportunity. They're, they're the reason Biden feels confident that he can put out a trillion dollar pandemic plan. And the reason... I think you can get Republicans to support what they've always said they were for, which is a trillion dollar infrastructure, hopefully green infrastructure rebuilding. Um, it opens up fiscal space because the interest rates are so low to do things that uh, uh, previously uh, were just ruled out of order, that we couldn't afford them. Uh, and so the low interest rates now uh, provide this opportunity uh, and the it's an imperative to meet climate, 
to make our economy work, to revive a, 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 a manufacturing sector, to revive a middle class, it's an imperative that we make those public investments in a wise, uh, bold, and creative way. And I think that will be the test of this administration and the next administration. Um, and uh, you know, it, it was the test for Trump in some ways, and he failed it completely. He never uh, put forth an infrastructure plan despite his promises to do so. He had no sense of an industrial policy or investment in research and development that would be important. And of course, he was a climate change denier uh, and just perverse in those regards. Now Biden uh, at least is saying the right things. He's going to face immense resistance from conservatives uh, in the Senate, both in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party. Uh, and uh, that's going to be a, a central fight of the next years. But as a society, we've got to get this right uh, and take advantage of the opportunity that these interest rates provide us or this economy is going to continue to decline. Another area that's uh, on the horizon, and a, and a guest I had on the podcast recently, Dina Sirnivasan, uh, is working on is the enforcement of antitrust, particularly related to the large uh, scale internet monopolies, the concentration of what you might call the channels through which we receive information, and the which you might call uh, editorial role that these companies like Facebook and Google are able to undertake. We've just seen a very interesting film in recent months called The Social Dilemma on Netflix. And they, uh, I guess somebody said to me, the punchline of that film was you're wrecking the minds of children and you're fostering a civil war between adults by only telling each side what they want to hear in order to boost advertising revenue. How, how do you envision the governance of that technology slash information sector and the role of antitrust in, how do you say, once again, improving the structure and performance of the American society? Well, I do think that uh, we've seen the danger of it in the uh, when the uh, all of the, the tech companies strip Trump of his platforms, um, which certainly he deserved, but on the one hand, but on the other hand, the power to do that uh, and to deprive a political a president, a political figure of his uh, ability to reach out to the public independently, is an incredible uh, power to put in the hands of very concentrated companies. So I suspect you're going to see bipartisan support for aggressive antitrust to break these companies up and to at least have uh, competitive platforms. That isn't the uh, end of the problem, however. Uh, you know, the problem is that the algorithms that they use to sell advertisement uh, really is are have perverse effects. So Google was selling when when uh, the QAnon people were talking about uh, militant uh, conspiracies. Google was uh, putting next to their their uh, tweets ads for uh, military supplies for guns and ammo and camouflage and what have you. Uh, so, you know, they were making money out of the ads, but the society pays a huge price for that kind of uh, reinforcement. And that you know the social media reality underneath it, which is uh, disconnected people finding uh, communities of interest that become consuming and distorting uh, uh, is, a, is a problem no matter how big the platform is. Uh, and I'm not sure how you solve that. I'm not sure how we get in front of that. You know, in the old days, we had the fairness doctrine in the national media, but I, I can't imagine how that would apply to social media. So I just, uh, I don't know how we get there. Yeah. If you were sitting in the cockpit of the Biden administration, we've been, we've been, which am I called, touring the menu of malfunction, dysfunction, or rising challenges. What would you do? What would you prioritize in the first hundred days to re-inspire confidence 
that we're getting back on the right track? Well, I, w- I think he started out right. I would go big on uh, trying to get uh, the pandemic uh, dealt with, get the vaccine out, help workers who have lost their jobs or pay, taking hour, cuts in hours or pay, uh, protect uh, homeowners and renters from being uh, thrown out of their homes and, uh, and losing their property, um, uh, give aid to the states and localities that have just been crippled by the lack of uh, tax revenues because the economies have been shut down. Uh, do uh, the return to schools in an incredibly safe way with teachers vaccinated and, uh, and kids uh, with uh, greater uh, uh, protections. If you got that, you know, and, and so the first thing to do a big agenda around that, I think he started and I think that's very important. Uh, he says he's going to come back immediately with a second agenda to deal with uh, rebuilding the country's infrastructure and uh, doing it in a way that is, at, uh, you know, that goes to renewable energy and energy efficiency. That could create uh, millions of jobs, good jobs. Uh, and if you can get it through the Congress, which is not clear, um, I think that's a great uh, uh, second step. Uh, at the same time, there's a set of things he could do with executive orders uh, that would, I think, be very important, like uh, making all government contractors uh, pay a $15 minimum wage, have paid family leave, uh, have <coughs> uh, sensible uh, employment policies, allow workers to unionize, and use the power of federal procurement by executive order to get a huge portion of our economy operating in the way, providing a model and operating in the way the entire economy ought to operate. Um, the irony of this period is that the, the progressive agenda that's been put out by Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and the Congressional Progressive Caucus and others uh, is incredibly popular. And so if you did the $15 minimum wage, if you did the Workers' Bill of Rights, if you did um, the Green New Deal and, and, uh, and being uh, really aggressive on investment in the pandemic and in keeping people whole in the midst of this pandemic, uh, those are all popular things that give you a shot, even if they're defeated in the Congress, give you a shot to win the argument in the next election. And, uh, and create the majority that would actually allow you to do real change. So that's how I would start. And the uh, sense, I guess, that, that many people have is that given the turmoil that President Trump raised, uh, I, I, I guess I say, I'm asking a question, which is like, is there a fork in the road now where the fear that was injected into many of our minds in light of the storming of the Capitol, does that create an urgency to restore order? Or does that create, a, we might call it, uh, a, a willingness to tolerate a more authoritarian response, which takes us further away from, uh, how would I say, a tranquil, contented rebuilding of trust. Well, uh, trust is hard to rebuild in a tranquil way at this point. It's very worrisome this connection between, uh, you know, cracking down on demonstrations as opposed to, uh, uh, and the, the line between uh, le- legitimate demonstrations and, and the violent ones that have to be, uh, have to be policed. And it's very hard for the authorities to do that. It's a very easy excuse to suppress uh, dissent uh, once you have violent demonstrations. And so I think that's, that's a significant worry. And, the um, the sense that um, that the society is uh, kind of reeling uh, out of control that, that law and order doesn't work that is now uh, seems to be expressed on both the right and the left um, 
is a is a uh, kind of real problem because the uh, the reaction to that's going to be an even more uh, is likely to be an even more authoritarian reaction. Um, so I think these are very uh, perilous times. I, I wish that Biden were starting this period uh, with a new hand, that, that this was a new age, that he could come forward with positive programs as he did the other day, and you could have the argument around that. Uh, I, I wish if I'd had my druthers, the Congress would have <coughs> censored Trump in both houses and and gotten done with it before the new uh, administration started. Uh, instead, we're going to start with the Senate spending half of its time on a positive program and half of the time on whether they uh, convict uh, Trump uh, and impeach him. Now, he, he deserves to be impeached. He deserves to be convicted. Uh, but if it gets in the way of uh, gaining popular momentum for a positive agenda, I think that's a real danger. And I sense uh, I, I I tried sometimes to imagine if I was a law enforcement officer. We've concentrated a great deal on individual freedom in the ethic of the United States, and I think we've seen some of the side effects relating to the pandemic. When I don't have to wear a mask. If I am out on the street, increases the likelihood that you'll become infected. In other words, we we affect each other. Similarly, the question of guns. I have the right to defend myself, but do you have the right not to be shot by me? Take that to a law enforcement officer. He's got a career defending a system which has been increasing inequality, despair, what Angus Deaton and Anne Case called the diseases of despair, suicide, opioid addiction, and the like. You're seeing people worried about increasingly about the opportunities for their children. And as they despair, they have guns. So now you're a law enforcement officer in an unsustainable, incoherent system. And you probably become afraid and want to protect yourself. And we even saw some law enforcement officers supporting or egging on or joining the uh, invasion of the Capitol the other day. And I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I, I don't want to demonize law enforcement, but I think I think that would be one hellish role to play in our society unless the underlying becomes what you might call repaired. And, and as we've been talking about, the incentives among elected officials, other than the fear of what's opening before our eyes, have not been sufficient to, to move us onto that healthier trajectory. What, what can you do for law enforcement now? People are talking about defunding the police, but I, I'm not sure I want no police with all kinds of people running around with guns in the street either. Well, the thing, the word you didn't mention in this is race, of course, which is. Uh, yes. Well, I was going to come to that next. <laughs> we've got to reform, uh, massively reform a police uh, system that is, and, and a justice system that is systematically racist. And uh, uh, some of that is changing the way we, the laws we have, you know, changing the, the stupidity about drug laws, et cetera, that put police in ridiculous situations. But a lot of that, some of that has got to be changing the, who the police are and the, and the way they're trained, et cetera, because uh, as we've seen in these different cities, the, the level of venomous uh, racism in the police force is a really frightening, uh, frightening thing. And on the other hand, what you say is exactly true. 
if you're an African-American uh, mother or Hispanic mother or a, a, a white mother and you live in an impoverished neighborhood, you want uh, authorities uh, to enforce the law and to keep the streets safe. And you don't want your sons and daughters to be trying to get to school in the midst of gang wars and, uh, and uh, you know, shootouts. And so, uh, you know, disarming or defunding the police, which is sort of the burlesque of what the position is, uh, isn't where uh, the great bulk of the people in, uh, in our urban areas, uh, it's not what, what they would think of. In fact, the kind of individual, I'll enforce the law myself, is probably much stronger in rural areas where the police are not much of a presence. And so people have their own guns and think they're going to defend their own doors. Um, but, you know, we've got to, you know, we've got to have more sensible uh, gun laws. Uh, it's grotesque that in the pandemic, the, one of the greatest growth markets has been the sale of guns. Uh, we've got to have an effective police force that's not an occupying force, but that's part of the community. Uh, we've got to replace the stuff that Reagan uh, wiped out uh, in terms of mental health facilities and and, uh, and capacity that helps people who are uh, uh, mentally uh, unstable um, and doesn't treat them as uh, people to be shot. Uh, so there's a whole range of reforms that uh, that are packed into this, uh, and I think you're right. If if I were a policeman, you know, I'd be worried that I'm going out on the street and I'm uh, I'm uh, underarmed, that they have AK-47s and I've got a pistol on my hip, and uh, I'd be damn worried about my own life and and etc. And so I mean, it adds to the tension of any of these situations when there's fear on both sides. Um, so, uh, I, you know, hopefully the sacking of the Congress and the violent assault uh, on the police officers there will um, be a sobering moment for the country. And we can uh, both go forward with reforming police and in uh, reestablishing authority for reformed police forces uh, and respect for law officers in a way that uh, has clearly been eroded over the last uh, last years. You know, Rob, just to, just to push on that a little bit, one of the things about um, a, a market fundamentalism, which is what we've had in both parties over the last 40 years, where there's this belief that the market, uh, you know, will solve all problems and that individualism is uh, the uh, greatest good and that uh, uh, greed uh, and, uh, and how, you know, you keep score by how much money you have. One of the problems with that ethic, uh, overwhelming uh, Protestant ethic or any religious morality or any other kinds of, uh, of limits or any sense of a common good other than uh, the Adam Smith notion that if we if we're all really greedy and uh, and individualistic, then our our collective uh, individual interest through the market will miraculously become the uh, the common good. Um, what that system uh, does over time is it undermines uh, completely the sense of community, uh, the sense that we are that we in fact do have a common stake, the sense that. Uh, that uh, we have uh, a respect one for another because we're all in this together. And the pandemic, I thought, was just a kind of classic example of that where, you know, you've got to have health care for everybody because those people who don't get health care are going to put everybody else at risk. You, you've, got, you've got to have uh, the ability of all workers who are sick not to go to work because if they have to go to work because they have no sick leave, paid sick leave, they're going to get their other employees sick. Uh, and you've got to have everybody responsible enough uh, as part of a community to wear masks and to socially distance. Otherwise, those protective measures don't work and the pandemic continues to grow. And of course, what's happened in this society is exactly that. Where we're now at 4,000 deaths a day um, and hoping that we have a technological response called the vaccine that will get us out of this because we don't have a communal response 
uh, that can overcome the individualism and the selfishness and the uh, the arrogance uh, that is that is the ethic of uh, of a market fundamentalism. Yeah, it's, it's a very uh, you know we've talked about how treacherous things are psychologically, but it's a very treacherous time when you think about the institutional organization of society and the unfettered free market is not a deity markets a tool and that's that the results of that experiment are hiding in plain sight and they're not nearly uh, as good as advertised and then you look on the other side and we've talked about the ways in which the state is captured the way the ways in which laws regulations enforcement appointments and so forth are driven by money power and it's not surprising that a lot of people have no faith in governance so in in your last comment here you've kind of gone to a different place which is it's not maintaining whatever our ethic is and reforming the institutions. What I gather you're suggesting is that we need to change the ethic so the goals that we have evolve and then the institutions become brought into line. Because if we keep pointing at the same places, we're not going to hit the bullseye. Yeah. Uh, you know, the this is a chicken and egg problem, obviously. But yeah, um, yeah. Clearly, uh, we've got to have when you have a you have this uh, market ethic and market uh, fundamentalism, which now has failed most Americans, and you still have the vestiges of a democratic system. We still have elections, even though they're dominated by money. We still have the possibility of voting for change. Um, and we still have the rights of free speech and an association and the possibility of demonstrating to demand change. And it, 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 you know, it, what the only way this thing works is that the, that the democracy is able through the institution of the state to call the private interests and the private greed, et cetera, back into account and to rebuild this sense of limits or some sense of limits and, and the sense of community. Uh, can it do that? I don't, you know, it's very hard at this point because we're so far down this road and we're, it's such an unequal society and, uh, we so much, uh, and we're so plagued by racism that allows us to see others as others. Um, it gets very hard, but there's no, there, there's nothing that's going to save this in the marketplace. And there's nothing that's going to save it from, uh, very rich people investing their money. The only thing that's going to save it is the, majority of Americans through the democracy calling uh, the marketplace back to account. And that's going to require governance that works uh, not for the few, but for the many. And that's, as you say, a total sea change from where we are. Well, you've covered a lot of ground, Bob, and uh, I'm just curious, are there other dimensions that you, you know, are the schools you know, uh, my, Michael Sandel from Harvard recently uh, put out a new book called The Tyranny of Merit. And the idea, I, I always refer to the great uh, thinker and uh, author Jane Jacobs, whose mm. last book in 20, 2004 was called Dark Age Ahead. And in that book, she wrote a chapter called Credentializing Versus Education. Hmm. Are we getting to a place where education, where, if you will, Lewis Powell and the Powell Memo have accomplished what they wanted, and where education is not itself a source of invigoration and evolution? It's a source of conformity and credentializing. Uh, how do I say? In a way that constricts the imagination and the will of the people to evolve in light of new challenges or evidence that our 
existing systems aren't aren't producing what we need. Well, clearly, we're a long way down that road. Um, the you have a, a the change party, the Democratic Party, uh, with a coalition now that brings together the well healed and the well educated, who uh, think of themselves as the winners in a meritocratic merit you know, in the meritocracy, uh, with uh, uh, the working and poor people who are disproportionately people of color, um, and who they offer that that uh, well-heeled class offers, uh, you know, identity politics to them. We'll give you the equal rights to be uh, uh, op- an opportunity to be a lawyer or a doctor or an Indian chief. Um, and as long as you uh, adhere to, to a very constricted set of views. Uh, and I think the, we're not completely there. You know, the universities are still dominated by, progressive voices in the social sciences, uh, but we're a long way down that road. And um, uh, the, the, you know, a corrective to it, to the meritocracy being simply a way to uh, reinforce the oligarchy, to reinforce the elite, um, uh, has got to be, it will come only, I think, uh, when the elite is sobered enough about the ruins around us and the upheaval that they start to get worried that they, they better make this thing work better for more people. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to it's not going to last. As you look on the horizon, private sector, political leaders in the United States, intellectuals, who do you see as the visionaries, the stewards, the beacons that you would encourage young people to go to the library or Amazon.com or YouTube and pay attention to? Well, that's an, that's an interesting and difficult question. I do think there's a new generation of economists that are, that are breaking down the, uh, the, uh, uh, assumptions and chivalrous of the uh, elite consensus, the Washington consensus, uh, that uh, offer scope for different kinds of thinking. I think there are um, uh, young voices, I guess. I would count much more on uh, not older and wiser people, but on young voices and young energy who in their enthusiasm and youth and uh, idealism and impatience uh, can create the energy that just makes things, uh, that adds to the impetus that the thing has to change. Uh, If the new generation, uh, uh, which is uh, right now the, the largest generation and the most diverse and the most liberal in its attitudes, if it doesn't, um, continue to drive uh, uh, real change and move not uh, move not only to carry the banner of uh, me too and uh, black lives matter but uh, as black lives matter is done to carry a uh, an economic agenda that works for workers of all kinds uh, we're going to count on them to make this happen uh, and their their leadership that now exists or that is emerging because I think um, uh, the older generation has uh, maybe some advice to offer, but it, it doesn't have uh, uh, it, you know, the sterling uh, clarity that youth has uh, at a time when fundamental change is needed. Yeah, I, I think, uh, how would I say, it's a difficult time to find those beacons of hope But I think in this anxious period, defining a vision forward and a direction forward is an essential part of the healing. Who are the the two or three moral leaders that you would name by name as people who offer a kind of sense of vision and hope and uh, and, uh, moral uh, Mm -hmm. reason? 
Well, I, I, there, there, it's across a, a spectrum. Uh, within in close to the economics profession, I would probably say Amartya Sen has explored many of these issues with great detail and sensitivity. Uh, I think that uh, there's a woman, Catherine Tanner. She used to be at Yale. She's a theologian. She's now... Uh, based at, uh, I believe, University of Chicago. Uh, I think that Martha Nussbaum has stirred the drink in a lot of the contours of social science and its relationship to the humanities in a way that's illuminating. My friend at Wayne State University, Jerry Heron, who's been in the laboratory of the decline in what I call the divorce of Detroit by America and mm-hmm. seen all of the pain and ramifications of that. Uh, I think Michael Sandel, go back to his book, Voltaire's Bastards, and about the nature of how reason is misused. Uh, there, there, there are a number of people who... Uh, I think do a, a wonderful job with poetry or literature. And it, rather than naming any particular artist, I would refer people to a woman named Maria Popova, who runs an online website called Brain Pickings, which seems to me to be extremely deep and broad in its awareness of people like William James or Jack Kerouac or uh, Muriel Rukeyser, who wrote a wonderful book, The Life of Poetry. But Maria tends to bring these things together on her website. And each day, as the events unfold, as the feelings unfold, she seems to understand how to, which am I called, not just exhaust you with the catalog, but point you right (laughs) <laughs> at what is germane right now. But it familiarizes you with the classics. I've been, uh, I would say, almost addicted to her website for several years now. And uh, and so I think that, that, how would I say, she plays a very, very interesting role. So, uh, so say the name of the name right again. Maria Popova, P-O-P-O-V-A. And it's called brainpickings. I think it's brainpickings.org. And uh, it's just a, uh, you could sign up for free and get a uh, weekly, and a, they give you a midweek dose and then a weekly dose, but you can follow her on Twitter. And uh, it's just a marvelous encycl- encyclopedia of insight. Uh, But there are many people. I mean, my friend Alex Gibney, the documentary filmmaker, seems to keep his eye on the ball in a way that I've always admired. We worked together on the film Taxi to the Dark Side, but he has a recent film called, uh, what was it? Uh, It's All Under Control, which is a sarcastic title because it was about the Trump administration's control of the pandemic in contrast with the South Koreans. Uh, so I, I, I guess there, how would I say, there's a mosaic. I mentioned to you in our previous conversation, John W. Gardner, who's been a mentor to a couple of my friends and advisors, in particular, John O'Neill, who wrote the wonderful books, Seasons of Grace and Paradox of Success. Uh, John W. Gardner's book that I'm reading currently is called The Recovery of Confidence. And he had been the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. He wrote a series of papers in the 70s and 80s. One is called one group of 12 papers is called The Leadership Papers. And chapter, I believe it's chapter five, is called The Moral Aspect of Leadership. And I would say moral sensibility and wisdom related to the common good pervades 
his thinking and his writing. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I still... one name I put in one name I put into this is Reverend William Barber, who's leading the. Modern... I was just gonna. I was gonna. I think William Barber. Uh, what did he call it? The the third, the second, or the third reconstruction. Exactly. His book, which related to the reconstruction, then the civil rights movement in the 50s and the 60s, and then the challenges before us, his Poor People's Campaign. Uh, he was the keynote speaker at the INET conference in 2016. You can go on the website, and I will say this. It was three days after the Trump was elected in Detroit, Michigan, at the Charles Wright Museum. And when he walked off the stage, I turned to the person sitting next to me, and I said, it's been an hour and 26 minutes, and I wouldn't change one comma. Uh, Reverend Barber is extraordinary in his, his sensitivity to the arts. When I was involved as a producer of a film on Aretha Franklin called Amazing Grace, we brought him to the premiere at New York Docs to give the comments afterwards for 20 minutes, and he just... I, mean, I still have people walk up to me and say, I saw those comments or I saw the YouTube of those comments. I can't believe that man's insight. So I don't know. There, I think there are, how I say, bits and pieces. Uh, another person, an old friend of mine, Shep Gordon, who was the music manager of Teddy Pendergrass, Ruther Van Dus, Kenny Loggins. They made a movie about him. Mike Myers made a movie called Supermensch, which I think yeah. everybody should watch because you see how he struggled and how he basically did good throughout. He's, he's still alive. He's recently a father, but I, I should probably bring him on the podcast. But the way in which he saw the purpose of life and led by example was extraordinary. And then I guess my final, my final offering, because I am very interested in the arts, is I think that if you immerse yourself in listening to John Coltrane, mm -hmm. it can't set you back. It can propel you forward. His uh, genius is not just technical, it's spiritual. And I know, uh, I say, a love supreme stands out as, as a particular yeah. work. But even listening to interviews between he and Frank Kofsky, he was such a soulful and, and constructive individual. I, I would have to put him in the pantheon of moral enlightenment or, or, or illumination. Well, that may be, John Coltrane may be a good way to end this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If, unless you have any others you want to nominate for the uh, Pantheon, I'm, I'm ready to do so. But William Barber, William Barber was a, a, a tremendous offering. So yeah. thank you, Bob. It was nice to talk with you. Let's uh, keep our fingers crossed and keep working hard through this inauguration and the early part of this administration and maybe we'll come back together and take the temperature of things again midsummer or so but thanks for being here today my pleasure take care now thank you bye-bye and check out more from the institute for new economic thinking at ineteconomics.org